You might want to sit down for this. This is the new Star Spangled Banner. Let's go. Star Spangled Banger by AKA. Red, white, and blue is the flag I wave. You and Survey, we the biggest gang. Star Spangled Banger by AKA. Star Spangled Banger by AKA. Red, white, and blue is the flag I wave. You and Survey, we the biggest gang. Star Spangled Banger by AKA. Star Spangled Banger by AKA. Represent USA every day. Not just independent veterans, eh? Like most of you voters ain't on you, fake. But still, you don't wanna embrace me in. Because of my facts in the state of being. The old man once told me they'll kill me cause I'm educated They hate it what they create They yell me a limb cause you messed it, mess it up Once had a message you fucked it, fuck it up I'm in the middle cause one thing I'm trouble And blacks call me Uncle Tom What the fuck? Ten years I served as a Murray troop Combat deployments I lived through two College the reason I'm still in school Record is clean but I'm black You won't kill me too Star Spangled Banger by AKA Red, white, and blue is the flag I wave You and Survey we the biggest game Star Spangled Banger by AKA Hey everyone, you're listening to the 21 Gun Podcast, and I'm your host as always, Kevin Sullivan. That was the Marine Rapper. Um, He's going to be on an episode coming up real soon. I'm not sure uh, if it's going to be the next one or or the one after that, but uh, he gave me the green light to use his music to open up these episodes. And uh, if you're not familiar with the Marine Rapper, well, get your head out of your ass and head over to themarinerapper.com. Just spell it out, the Marine rapper.com and you will see all his stuff all his content his uh label which is ninja punch records um just an awesome guy really really cool guy funny as hell i didn't realize how funny that guy was but um check him out over on his youtube site and uh you'll see what i mean this week's episode is actually an old episode when i say old i mean a couple years ago uh with my old podcast wait what if um, people have asked me what that is cause I, I bring it up every now and then just go over to waitwhatif.com and, uh, look at episode archives and, and it was called the poor man's Joe Rogan, which pretty much <laughs> sums up, uh, what the podcast was all about, but it was a good time. Uh, I loved doing those episodes. We've talked about, you know, bringing it back up if we can ever find time to do it. But, um, yeah, this is, uh, Nicolette Maroulis. She is a Navy veteran and she was injured back in Iraq. She literally went from wheelchair to the top of the world. She got injured in a, in a bomb blast and was in a wheelchair and eventually, not only got out of the wheelchair, but she rode a hand cycle across the continental United States, and then she climbed, I'm going to screw this up, Nicolette, it's a Labouche, <laughs> Labouche, whatever it is, it's a mountain that's right next to Mount Everest. Uh, she was featured in the documentary High Ground and on uh, Two Shining Seas, which is the one that I was on uh, with her. So uh, really, really inspirational woman. Uh, I, she's a good friend of mine, and uh, I really enjoyed having her on the show. And we got to get a an updated um, interview. The reason why this one's coming on is because I think her story needs to be told, and it was right there. I mean, I just um, I had it recorded, so I thought I'd share it with my IW folks. Hey, speaking of IW, we have some hikes coming up. I got a few weeks to to recuperate and maybe get a little training in, but the next one is going to be March 21st over in Galveston, Texas, and then after that, the, my first hike of the year is going to be April 11th over in Jacksonville, North Carolina, followed by Savannah, Georgia, on April 25th. I don't think I have any other things to to bring up. Um, a lot of you reached out to be correspondents, and I really, really appreciate that. Some people volunteered to do some video editing because we're going to bring a uh, video to this podcast. And so that's awesome, guys. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, it's tough to go at it alone, and um, you guys are really, I, I think it's going to make this this podcast just a little bit better. We're going to try to get those weekly episodes out. Uh, I got Jeremy Walton on, who's going to be the producer, and, and uh, he's going to be helping out, you know, getting these shows out there and um yeah i think it's great so i ran out of things to say so without further ado nicolette maroulis
Okay, so let's get started. So, all right. The first thing is you served your country in the in the Navy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I had an awesome job in the Navy. Yeah. I did some joint ops missions and unfortunately got injured. And uh, so that was kind of a, a big part of my life for a period of time. Um, and I mean, I still have to deal with some of my injuries to this day, uh, especially the traumatic brain injury part of it yeah. um, and hearing loss and a few of those things um, as well as um you know, more of the physical stuff with my back and legs and that type of stuff that I'm still dealing with, but I've definitely come uh, pretty far since I got injured. So, yeah. And, and, um, there's, it, it's not hard to find info on you, believe it or not. <laughs> but <laughs> no. you were, you were in a wheelchair for three and a half years, right? I was, yeah. Wow. And um, was that from uh, hip injuries or because I, I read something about your hip or was that a back issue, issue or was it kind of a combination? You know, it, it's hard for me to know exactly because I was injured so early on and they didn't know a lot about TBI at that time or okay. at least weren't looking for it. And so I think part of it was just brain issues. Mm -hmm. Um, I think part of it was my back issues probably more than hip. And then, um, you know, I've, I've had some surgeries on my knees and, and my legs. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly what, uh, cocktail, yeah. you know, got me in the chair, to be honest. I, I think as, time progressed and I had more surgeries, I started doing better. So I, I, I think it was a combination of quite a few things. Yeah. Do they, they didn't know much about TBI, uh, like you're saying, are they, are they figuring this out more? Do they know more or what's going on? You know, that's that? one of the best things, I guess, that you could say come out of war is that there's so much, um, medical advancements, um, and so they're definitely learning more. It's it's really interesting because, of course, traumatic brain injury has been around forever. Yeah. Um, so you would think with as many wars as we've been in and football players and all this that it would have had a bigger spotlight. Um, but it, it didn't until after this war and until we've had more and more soldiers coming home injured. Yeah. Um, I think that they're learning a lot. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Pittsburgh and learn um, about how they treated traumatic brain injuries there, how they treated their football team, mm -hmm. um, the type of things that they look for, um, and to do some research of my own, which I'm a published. Um, I, I got my article published, nice. so I'm pretty thrilled about that. Where, um, where can you read about it or where can you find it? I don't remember. I have to you, look it up. <laughs> you can you can email it to me, and what I do with each show is I put a list of links on there, and and uh, if people want to look it up, they can they can read it. But that's that's Sweet. cool. Um, so let's go back even further than that. So um, before you went into the Navy, uh, how old were you when you went in? <laughs> You're making me do math because yeah, I'm trying to remember. Oh I remember when we were riding. I feel like when we were riding, we were talking, um, and we'll talk about that too on the the show here about our cross country ride. But it, I feel like it was a while. Like you had been recovering for a while, and that was five or six years ago. So maybe it was five or six years before I that. I joined right after September 11th. Okay. I actually joined the next working day. Oh, really? Although I joined from overseas, and so it took me a while to actually get um, to the first boot camp or whatever that was offered. Yeah. Um, so we were we were probably on the same age, probably 24 or 25. Yeah, we'll yeah. go with that. Yeah, because I yeah. think that's how old I was. You know what's funny? My original enlistment date was September 12th, 2000, 2011. Same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh I was, I was in, I was a, um, I went to officer candidate school. So technically I was an E something, uh, I think an E five when you do that. But then I, I had like the next day was my official swear in day. Like I could have left up until that point. Um, they have a day like, that's like a drop dead day. Like if you still, if you have any doubts about it, air force, you know, air force, it's like, if you're not <laughs> feeling, if you're not feeling nice about it and maybe we yelled too much, you can still. So when we were holding hands and eating cupcakes, they're like, do you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so no, literally it was the next day. So on my, on my paperwork, uh, it has September 12th, 2001, which is kind of wow. Cool. So you were young that where were you? You were overseas before this happened? 
Yeah, I got an awesome gig and got to work um, overseas. I was in Germany at the time. Okay. And so it was pretty cool. Yeah. Did you, so you always had sort of like a more of an adventurous type of person versus someone that was ever going to be comfortable um, following the nine to five job, uh, oh, yeah. sitting at a desk going. Always. Know, yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it. Um, yeah. And then it's not like you didn't just go Navy and same thing, work um, a clerk desk or anything. You were operations, right? Right? You were a dog handler. Well, and, and in fact, that's why I didn't join the Marine Corps. Oh, really? I was more interested in the Marine Corps, but the Marine Corps wouldn't promise me, you know, they said, we put you where we want you. Like, you yeah. don't get to take a job. And I'm like, I don't want a desk job. Yeah. And I was so concerned that I get a desk job that I said, uh, let, let me go somewhere else. So I went Navy because yeah. of that. So, yeah, then uh, you got injured uh, and then you're was it a while that that you had got medically retired or how did that work out for you? Yeah, I was injured in 03 and got <laughs> medically retired, I think, officially in 07. OK, so, so you were yeah. still in recovering. And in, in, uh, uh, yeah, were you up at um, uh, what's the name of that? I'm dry. I'm, I want to say. Well, yeah, 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 that's um, help me out here. Brooks Army Medical Center. Okay, Brooks Army Medical Center. Because I'm actually really interested in in, in TBI, uh, they didn't really know anything, but they still don't know anything about it. It can happen with one concussive injury. It can happen with multiple, right? So if like you're on the tanks and you're firing 105s all day long, six inches from your head, that these people can all of a sudden have uh, loss of memory and all the all the, the all the signs and symptoms of it. Is that true? Um, so there's a lot of debate on that. Most say that it can either happen with, um, something like a, an explosion or like what you're describing one event, um, or it could be, uh, an opened wound, a bullet, you know, to the yeah. brain or something like that. Um, normally it's one event that causes it. And then you're more likely to have more issues with the more impacts. So, uh, NFL player gets hit, gets knocked unconscious. The likelihood of him getting knocked unconscious again is much greater sure. than, than if he had never gotten hit in the first place type of thing. And so now they're, there's a lot of different precautions that they're trying to take as far as that goes in civilian life. In war, it's a little bit different. It's yeah. a little bit harder to, <laughs> to yeah, take those type of precautions. They don't think too much about safety when you're... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did a lot of MMA and, and combat sports for uh, right around... Actually, I was, I was still in the military, and then when I got out, I kept I kept with it. But you would, you would notice guys who all it took was one knockout. So these guys would have like a strong jaw and they were going and fight all the time and, and be known for their endurance and one knockout. Uh, that's all it took sometimes. And then if they went in, you know, sometimes it'd be the lightest hit and they'd be unconscious again. And you were like, Holy crap. And these guys are doing this to themselves in the amateur world. And it's no no telling what they're going to be doing or, you know, what the long-term repercussions are going to be for that. I guess it's it's been on the radar for probably right around when you got hurt. That's when they really started noticing it, back 2003, 2004, right? Um, maybe towards the end. I don't think that they really – I didn't get diagnosed until probably 07. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. I and mean, it was quite a while, and I had all the signs. I had uh, hearing loss. I had seizures. I had um, memory loss. Uh, I had all the signs for it, but yeah. they just, and they treated each individually. Um, I got migraines. I had never had migraines before and have had intense migraine since, um, have an issue with sound and light. Mm-hmm. Um, but they just never connected them all with me, you know, and it could have just been when I came in and then by then I slipped through the cracks by the time they started getting more keen onto that. Um, and then, um, started getting it all connected and, you know, uh, uh, speech therapists are kind of your best friend when you have traumatic brain injury and trying to find a good one and, and, uh, occupational therapists do a lot as well, but speech therapy, there's nothing like it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. and it's still, it, I mean, it's so 2007, I mean, if you think about the, the process of a lot of under other injuries and illnesses, I mean, they're, it's in the infancy. 
Uh, yeah. what, what type of, so the therapy sounds like after they figured out that's what was going on with you, how did they treat it? Uh, basically, I guess I don't know what the typical regimen is. Um, I assume um, it's a lot of PT, OT. Well, I had a lot of issues talking mm -hmm. at first. And again, that was before I was actually diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And so we went through just basic learning sounds and speaking and putting things together. Yeah. Um, but they've gone, I mean, they do a lot more than just that with speech therapy, even though, you know, it sounds like it would just be speech oriented, but they can help you with tricks on how to, um, how to remember things better, how to just daily day to day type things. They do believe in a lot of cognitive therapies now. There's quite a few different treatments um, that they can try out, but the speech therapists really kind of take you through a full reign of uh, different memory techniques. And um, the thing that that influences your memory the most is stress, lack of sleep, and pain. Okay. And unfortunately, I'm pretty Yeah. I pretty much have all of those every day. So Sure. It uh it definitely doesn't help, but um just coming up with different cognitive things. And then I had an amazing occupational therapist after many that that I just didn't connect with. I found one that was awesome that tried to teach me how to play guitar again. And, you know, it was those type of techniques that really helped kind of link those brain waves back. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not a hundred percent. I'm not 80% compared to how I used to be, but, uh, I'm doing pretty good compared to a lot of people. So I count my blessings. Yeah. And, and being at the, I guess the forefront of this or the, the, for lack of a better term, the introductory TBI pro program, I guess, but you, it, it must feel if you're going to suffer from this to be in one of the first groups that are being treated, you're almost trailblazing the, uh, you know, the regimen that people go through. So are they using, are you talking to people? Are you getting out there and, and telling your story? Well, I think that by the time I was diagnosed, there were already people that were coming in that were being diagnosed right away and were the real trailblazers. Okay. I think I kind of fell through the cracks. And then by the time they're like, oh, that's what you have. Okay. There was kind of already a system in place to some extent. Okay. Um, I definitely talk to people, especially other people with TBI, because I think it's important. There's... Um, there's kind of a level of shame, <laughs> for lack of a better word, that comes with having a brain injury. Really? Um, absolutely. There's so many conversations I don't want to, I would love to participate in, but I don't because I don't want to sound stupid. I don't want to forget what I was saying. I don't want to, I may know what I want. Forgetting words is a big thing. I make up words all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I may know what I want to say, but can't get it out and yeah. to be in a room full of people and you're talking and you're holding a conversation, then you just freeze and trying to say something and can't figure out how kind of is embarrassing. Yeah. And then there's, um, you know, I used to love sports. I was a huge Lakers fan. I have been since I was a little kid, love football, love basketball, and I just have no enjoyment in them anymore because I can't remember stats. I don't remember who played who. I don't remember who won. Even if I look it up, it's not something that I can retain. And so it's just not fun for me. I just don't find the enjoyment in it that I once did. So I kind of avoid it. So that was like a big part of my life that I had growing up that I just, I don't even um, entertain anymore because it's, it, just doesn't do it for me anymore. Yeah. That and, be, and that's, well, I was go just going to say, that's got to be frustrating. I, I could imagine that would be probably the, the worst thing versus, you know, uh, uh physical pain. Uh, cause I mean, that sticks with you when no one can see it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it definitely has changed my personality. I think in a lot of ways because I'm, uh, hesitant to talk, um, and so it, it excludes me out of a lot of stuff. And, you know, it, even reading a book, you know, I used to really enjoy reading a book. And if I read it, uh, well, I went back to college after I got injured to get my degree. Mm -hmm. 
and even reading my textbooks, um, if I put them down, I don't remember the information that well. Yeah. So, you know, reading a, a fictional book, like, let's say, um, I won't remember the characters. So I have to like do a whole spreadsheet or yeah. I have to read book page, you know, cover to cover so that I can get all the information. Otherwise I pretty much have to start from the beginning to try and figure it out because it just doesn't make sense to me when I try to pick it up. So I don't really enjoy reading. Like I used to read recreationally and I don't really enjoy that anymore. So it's, it's just those things that you kind of identify yourself with, you know, uh, I consider myself pretty intelligent, yeah. got injured. And it's like that identity um, just kind of goes away a little bit. And you kind of have to just accept it and move on to this new identity because the longer you hold on, the the more difficult it can be, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm never going to be able to be that person again. So... You know, it's it's taught me a lot. <laughs> it sounds like, I mean, your adaptive uh, abilities sounds like helped you out a lot, too. I mean, the fact that you were uh, a motivated, which we'll get into that uh, coming up. But I mean, you, you know, to be able to do the spreadsheets, to be able to do things like that. I mean, that's that's a huge character uh, trait that if you didn't have that, you could easily be, uh, you know, I don't know to what degree, but, you know, you could be a homeless uh, veteran with TBI, you know. Uh, and it makes me wonder how many are, are out there that, that don't understand or don't have the ability to, to adjust and, and end up like that. I think TBI plays a huge role in a lot of what we see as character flaws with, um, with veterans, sure. especially because that's who I'm in contact with. So anybody that has TBI, but I'm going to use veterans because that's who I'm in closest contact with. It changes who you are. It changes, you know, uh, your response to things. You anger quicker. You have more of a um, of a immediate response to things than before. So I think that there's a lot of things that can definitely be contributed to TBI, where you're not really thinking through the problem and you're just reacting. But I also think that um, I also think that there in our society, there's a level of um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the proper way to say this. I think that we also need to take responsibility for our actions. Mm -hmm. And that's not always we're not always held accountable, especially if we're veterans right now. I think that um, because of the disgrace that the Vietnam veterans were faced with when they came home, just being, you know, um, tormented. Sure. Uh, I think society wants to right that wrong. And unfortunately we're not doing it in a healthy way. And so um, it doesn't provide for a healthy atmosphere to grow and to become the best that you can with whatever disability uh, you may have. And that kind of concerns me. Do you think that it plays a role in the uh, amount of suicides that we're seeing? And Absolutely. Yeah. Here's, here's what I think is the biggest issue in the amount of suicides we're seeing. Um, when you go to war, and I, I realize that not everybody that commits suicide in the military has deployed. Right. Um, I, I'm going to talk about those that have, when you go to war for the first time in your life, there's an importance that's put on you that you've never felt regardless what your job's been before that you've never experienced before in your life. Um, you understand that the guy next to you is depending on you and that you better show up for your job in the same manner that you're depending on him and he better show up for his job. Mm -hmm. Um, and that bond and that tightness is unbelievable. And, you know, they say that, you know, uh, I do it for the guy next to me. And in that moment, you truly feel that way. You truly believe that you truly in your heart of hearts 
feel that you're, everything you're doing is impacting the people right around you. And it doesn't, politics don't matter at that time. Nothing else matters at that time. It's getting your guys out. Sure. Yeah. Um, you come home injured. There's no homecoming. There's no, um, you know, welcome home. Let's integrate you back into society. You're in a hospital bed. And you just went from this extreme partnership, being part of a team, being needed, being validated to an extent that you've never been able to before in your life, um, to being put in a hospital bed where it becomes all about you. How are you doing? Where are you at? What's going on with you? How are you feeling? Uh, what's going on today? Everything's about you. Um, your healing and your road to recovery. Um, and it becomes kind of, at first extremely uncomfortable. And then it, um, it, your sense of being needed and part of a team goes away. Um, because here you are at more than likely your most vulnerable spot that you've ever been in your life. And, um, it's just all about you. So then you get back into civilian life, you know, you're out of the hospital, you're medically retired, you're at home. And, uh, where is that? Where is that team? All of a sudden you're, or, or you're back at your base or whatever it is. But it's not the same. It, the The sense of being needed um, and being part of a team has gone away and it's all about you. And then you get into the spiral of thoughts about how, uh, what does my future hold? How am I going to be? This identity that you, you know, um, grasped um, is now gone because you're injured mm -hmm. and what do you do from here and i think that that sense of um of it being all about you and you're not at your best uh is daunting i mean that's pretty intense um and for the guys that haven't been injured i mean they're still coming home and all of a sudden, it you know, it doesn't really matter if you show up to work. It doesn't really matter. You know, nobody's going to die today. And it's almost a, a depression um, or a letdown from the adrenaline of war of um, feeling like you're part of a team and that you're important. And I think it's just rough. It's hard. It's the weirdest thing to, um, like I was telling you, I, I watch 13 hours to watch something like that and to see uh they have you know shots of the middle east and everything and and it's this weird and i guess people who've never experienced military never experienced combat wouldn't understand it but it's 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 not fun it's not fun to be in combat but when i was watching those scenes part of me was like you know i wanted to be back there you know i wanted to be with like he said with my team uh yeah it's it's a weird thing um I could easily have gone in a different direction, easily, without a doubt. Because if you're dealing with stuff uh, to, to you know, like let's say you can't sleep at night, to pop an Ambien and just be done for the night and not have to think about anything is fantastic. To drink, you know, uh, you know, some whiskey or a bunch of beer before you go to bed and just be done with it is, is uh, another easy way to do it. Um, but to... You know, to have the responsibility of a wife, of a family, you know, knowing that it, it, it just made things, it gave me direction when I was coming out. And if I didn't have that, who knows? Who knows where I'd be? Well, and I think that there's some interesting components with that as well, because having a family, having a spouse that hasn't served they don't necessarily understand it and when i've talked to a lot of guys that have come back who have had wives that haven't served um they ask them a lot of questions and you know in general i think whenever somebody finds out that you've deployed they have a ton of questions 
And the thing is, if you weren't there, it doesn't matter how much detail somebody can go into. You're not going to get it. Yeah. And so if you come back um, as a soldier injured um, or emotionally torn and need to talk to somebody, the chances are you're not going to have a safe environment to talk to somebody um, that has deployed so you're talking to somebody that hasn't deployed and you already know that they don't get it and it's almost uh you know it's it's you're wasting your time because you're never going to understand and and what i find is people normally either make you into a god oh my oh you're amazing that you did this and it's like give me a break or they criticize you and you're like screw you you weren't there i don't care what you think about you know yeah anything I've done because until you're in my shoes, you know, and I think all of us have, um, have things from that period of, of time that, um, are regrets and that are hard. I have some huge regrets that I live with every day, you know, um, and it's not something that I can talk to civilians about. Yeah. And, you know, I think that um, most civilians don't really get that. <laughs> they don't. What, what was really hard is initially when I got out, um, going back to grad school, uh, you know, here I am in a class full of, I was 33. It was right after our bike ride. It was 33, and I'm in a classroom full of 22, 23-year-olds. And, you know, we would go over the tests, the exams, and they're quibbling over an answer. And I'm like, just accept it. You got it wrong. Move on. But they couldn't do that. Yeah. There was such a disconnect. It was very difficult for me to, to, uh, I, I had some close friends through, through there, but for the most part, I kind of kept to myself and did my own thing. It was very difficult to relate to them and for them to relate to me. And I think that that's so true. And I think that so many people, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, you get stuck in your head and, and you look around and you think that whatever you're going through is so important. You know, I, I have a friend who has a teenager right now and, you know, she feels like the end of the world is here yeah. because, uh, you know, she doesn't have her new car and she's just so upset and, you know, and it's, it's so <laughs> damaging and it's so interesting. It, as you know, I worked uh, some investigations, and uh, and so I'd have to show up on different scenes with my dog. And you could have two witnesses that were there that that witnessed the same exact thing, and you know, one would be completely calm and say, "Okay, here's exactly what happened," and the other one's like in fetal position, bawling their eyes out, like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe," you know. And it's because of what has happened in their life and that's what they brought to the table. And that's how, so, I mean, I think when you've been to a ward, you've been to different places in some ways, um, with maturity, it kind of puts some of that into perspective and you can, I know for me, I can, I can let things go a little bit easier, um, than beforehand where I, I would be frustrated over, an a question or something yeah. like that you're just like ah oh, whatever <laughs> yeah it really does put everything in perspective yeah. um my my thing too that uh was difficult uh, and it hasn't happened in a long time actually having children uh has been more therapeutic to to my life than anything else because uh so I wasn't taking medicine and it's, it's the typical thing. They put you on medications. You feel better. You feel great. So you're like, I don't need to take medications. You come off them. And then, uh, a lot of the stuff came back And my, a lot of my symptoms were fits of just, just what I call the red zone, just rage over silly things. Um, and my wife would see it and she'd be like, what is wrong with you? And she, she didn't understand it. Um, but right. then, but then having children, it was like, you needed the patience. You had to learn the patience. Those two, you know, two, three, 
the clock in the mornings with them crying and walking up the down the hall. Here's a little human being that I love more than anything in life. And they could scream in my ear and it just wouldn't bother me. I just learned to just accept it. And yeah, I would say my biggest, um, uh, gains in, in, uh, moving on from my issues was probably having kids. A lot of that. I mean, if you think about it, it's taking you out of it. It's getting you out of your own head because you are part of this, you know, other people need you. Yeah. Um, and it just happens to be kids, which brings a whole different complication and dynamic into it. Well, I also know? think I, I also realize that they're watching me and we're driving down the road. Yeah. And what used to get me completely out of control um, doesn't anymore. Like someone pulls out and almost hits us. And you would think I would get more pissed because my kids are in the car and someone almost hits us. But uh, I just don't. I don't flip out. I don't yell. Um, situations get escalated. I now talk quieter and I... I it's it's been so there's the answer if you have any post-traumatic stress or anything just have kids it'll be so no that's not the answer especially if you if you you know can't deal with it but speaking of pts i find it interesting how much pts and tbi have in common yeah um as far as their symptoms and um i really wish that there was more research on that but uh, i'd be very surprised there's Nobody that I can think of that has TBI that doesn't have PTS. Um, there's very few people that I can think of that have PTS that don't have TBI, but I do know of a few. But I wonder if um, how that's working in, in that part of the brain and um, how much they're interlaced and if a PTS can... Um, maybe reactivate uh, old, um, maybe not TBI, but um, concussion. Mm -hmm. How many people with PTS have had a concussion at some point in their life that don't have TBI now? I'm just curious about that type of stuff. I'd be really interested to see where that connection is because the symptoms are so similar on so many different levels. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as far as the physical symptoms for me, they, they're directly related to if I'm getting sleep or not. And I'll still get the physical symptoms because um, I don't I mean, there's it, it comes in waves. There'll be months that I just don't sleep. It's just constant nightmares. I mean, sleep becomes the worst thing in the world because I know when I close my eyes, it's going to be just me versus whatever is, is my brain's conjuring up at the time. And then if that happens, even if I go to bed at 10 and wake up at seven in the morning, I get a full night's sleep. Technically, I just can't move the next day. I'm just dragging. Like you said, concentration wise, I can't concentrate. And this goes on. This will go on for like two or three months for me. And then I'll have some reprieve. I don't know why it'll just kind of go away for a little bit. And those are the best times because then I can sleep and relax. But then I know it's coming right back. Let's let's um. Let's go on to the bike ride. It was just the most amazing trip that I ever had. And people talk to me about it. And it was, oh, you rode your bike across country. Uh, cool. How long did it take? It's usually the first thing. How long did it take? Where did you sleep? Um, it's hard to get to, to explain really what we went through during that trip. I mean, it was amazing. So for the listeners, what we did, it was a group of veterans. We got bikes. Some people uh, had br uh, brain injuries. Some people had spinal injuries. Some people were missing limbs. So they had all these bikes that were adapted to them. And uh, we started on one coast out in San Francisco. And we rode all the way across to uh, to Virgi yeah, Virginia Beach over 63 days. Um, and, and that was basically it. I think the bike ride itself was... I think it was therapeutic in some ways, but I also think that it kind of made me really admit to myself in some ways where I was physically, and that was a little bit hard. Yeah. And um, it, it brought up a lot of emotions. And when I think back on it, a part of me wishes that I could have just kind of taken my head out of it and... Yeah enjoyed it for what it was. And I don't think I got the full opportunity to do that because I was constantly dealing with stuff. Like it, it definitely brought up a lot for me. And I think in a way that was kind of the point of the ride, wasn't it? To, to address um, these issues. Not the point. Well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what, 
what World Team Sports does, and you know, they, they, I don't know, it's just an idea. I mean, do you? So no, basically, I, I think it was. Yeah, I think that in my own, um, my own ego. I didn't think that it would affect me like that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it might affect everybody else. But for me, it would just be a cool bike ride and I'll be able to handle it and it won't be a big deal. Um, and it really made me face a lot of my own kind of demons um, in a lot of different ways. You know, it was the first time since I've been injured that I was in such close quarters with so many different personalities for such a long oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> and the the part that was most difficult about that for me was because I was um, I'm able to hide a lot of the things like we talked about uh, the with the TBI um, with PTS um, a lot of my physical injuries even um, if I'm in pain or discomfort I remove myself from a situation so nobody sees it and I deal with it on my own. I don't deal with it in the public. I don't deal with it around people. Um, and I basically met up with a bunch of strangers who pretty quickly on saw me, you know, in pain. Yeah. Um, and saw, you know, all these insecurities that I had about TBI. Um, I had to work through that instead of just being able to remove myself or be quiet in a corner, you know? Um, yeah, that's true. I never considered it like that. I never, I never really thought about that, that whole aspect. Yeah. That part was super intense for me. I just wasn't used to it. Cause at the end I of a, always being able to just, you know, just blend in with the background and yeah. disappear and it not be a big deal, but it was day in and day out. And yeah. Day I mean, in we, and day out. <laughs> we were being filmed. A documentary film was being made. And I mean, yeah, you're right. So at the end where you pretty much just want to lay down in bed and recoup for the day. Cause these weren't easy days. We were riding some days, a hundred, over a hundred miles heat, uh, just, uh, total dehydration and, and remember the salt that would just collect on everything. And, and then instead yeah. of that, you get to the end and then there's a documentary crew with their camera in your face or the news crew or just people, people that were like, Hey, wow, let me look at your bike. And you, you have to put all that behind you. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's an aspect I didn't, I didn't really think about. Yeah. That part was difficult for me. Um, being on show has always been difficult for me. I think when I was in the hospital, um, you know, there were congressmen and yeah. senators yeah. from states I hadn't been to that would come and want picture ops and stuff. And um, so being on show was always really uncomfortable for me. So, you know, that part coming in and having people um, you know, would be clapping and I'm like, don't clap. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and, and yeah, it was, it was interesting because it just made me face so much of my own stuff. Um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't give me a break from it. You know, it was all day, every day is, is how I felt about it. You know, it was here, these are people I don't even know. And I'm just facing all these fears right in front of them. And, you know, in the big picture, you guys weren't even thinking about me, but you know, in my own head, it was like, Oh gosh, this is, this is not ideal. Yeah. And especially as <laughs> that being said, yeah, there were some amazing moments. I mean, there were some moments that I will take with me forever. I, I remember, and I don't remember what state it was, but us riding and there was a Vietnam veteran that had pulled over to the side of the road and he got out of his truck. And when we went by, he took me wow. and he just had me ball. He had a huge flag and it was in the middle of nowhere. And he just had me balling. And I pulled over to talk to him. And here was a guy that had served our country that had never gotten a welcome home. And he, he said, there's no way that I wouldn't come out and make sure that you guys got your welcome home yeah. and just had me floored. And I mean, I was in tears. I'm like, wow, you know, here's a, a generation of people that have sacrificed so much and gone and fought 
for all these rights that we say, oh, the VA is horrible, and which, you know, they definitely need improvement. But the reason that we have what we have now is from the generations before us that have fought for it. And, um, you know, I just, he just moved me so much. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it was a lot of those type of moments that I was just, um, there's just no words. I mean, yeah. those moments will stay with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, the bike ride became, it started about uh, us. And I remember someone put this on the site. It, it started about us, but towards the end, it was about everyone else. You know, there was that, that you know, those people that could, everyone you met in another town had a story about their son or their daughter or their grandfather or, or you know, whatever it was. And it 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 definitely was... You know, we signed up for it. We kind of were, you know, <laughs> put on parade at times. But uh, at that point, you just kind of had to roll with the punches because you knew, you know, it, it made people feel good to come out and see us and bring us water or, or, like you said, like that guy you talked to. Had you been on a hand cycle prior to that? or I went on two rides after I got accepted to wow to that ride. Yeah. So I had never been on one. And then... Um, I contacted World Team Sports because I saw the Face of America ride. And I'm like, well, this looks unbelievable, but I can't ride a bike, you know, yeah. but this looks really cool. Can you tell me more about it? I'm interested in it. And um, and they said, oh, sure. And then they told me about this ride and they're like, do you want to do it? And I'm like, sure, that's awesome. Absolutely. Without a doubt. And it was so mind blowing to me that here's somebody that would take this that I just told I've never yeah. ridden a bike since I got injured, you know, and would take that big of a risk on me like, oh, well, here, come cross country with us. And um, and it was just I, I knew at the moment that it was a once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, I because my injuries, me camping out in a tent along the road just isn't possible. You know, that's just not something that I'd be able to do. And so, um, to have the type of support and, um, and to be so new, uh, at hand cycling and to, to have that, I mean, uh, dream come true. So for the listeners, dream I had not dreamt of that came true yeah. <laughs> for the listeners you can actually go online. Um, I'll put, I'll put, whatever links on the website and everything, but you can see her. I remember that, that bike, it was green, right? It had a, a green hand cycle. Um, yeah. if you haven't seen hand cycles, they, they're, they're pretty amazing. Uh, there's a bunch of different versions, you know, you have those race ones and, um, uh, Seth, I know Seth had all these different, <laughs> different ones that he had, but yeah, um, Seth was awesome. The, the more laid back it is, of course, the more aerodynamic it is. Um, I'm kind of a control freak. Yeah. And so being able to sit up, taller, um, made me feel better. Uh, I couldn't imagine with my back issues to lay back the entire time anyways. Um, but sitting up made me feel better and I felt like I could look around a little bit more and that type of thing. But, uh, you definitely, um, you know, you miss out on some of the speed by doing that, but, sure. uh, my bike was awesome. Um, so Next thing, of course, I have to ask you about because this this blows my mind. Our friend, uh, by the way, Chad Jukes just just climbed Everest. But I, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Uh, yeah, it's like going to the moon, except climbing your way there. <laughs> so yeah, in the shadow of that, uh, you climbed Mount Le Boucher. Say it again. That that's that's a pretty big shadow. Yeah, but still, I mean, <laughs> I don't think you can sit and start with Chad doing Everest and then. Oh, by the way, well, no, I think it is because um, you weren't a mountain climber, just as you weren't a cyclist, you weren't a mountain climber, and then here you go, you go to Nepal, and it was only a few months after we did the the cycle ride. That's true. So this one, um, I went to. Um, Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. I was just going to say, I knew, I know obviously everything about the, the bike ride, um, not your take on it, but this one, I know nothing about really, uh, except for what I saw in the, the movie Higher Ground. So listeners, if you check out, and I'll put a link on my site, um, they, she, she, she went with a group of veterans to, um, uh, Nepal to climb Le Boucher, uh, 
and there's a, a documentary on it called Higher Ground, uh, and it actually has Chad Jukes in it too, who uh, we just mentioned just uh, climbed Everest. But all right, so aside from that, let's go. Let's go back. So how did you? You were asked while we were on the bike ride, if I remember right. To, to do so this. I have to correct you. It's called high ground. High ground. Okay. So it's called high ground, um, not higher ground. I was asked, I, I found out about it in San Francisco, I believe. And I was pretty, um, I was pretty amazed that they were going to do that. And yeah. I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty intense. Let me get in on that. And so I asked in San Francisco, I, I talked to, um, uh, Jeff Messner and I said, you know, I'd be really interested in this. If you have any slots left, it's right up my alley. I'd love to do something like that. Uh, and he said, okay, well, let me think about it. And um, I found out in Lake Tahoe that I was going to be able to go on it. Perfect place to find out because it was snowing and it was, we were probably what, 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet there. So I mean, and I was just floored. I was amazed. Yeah. I didn't know much about it. I'd never been mountain climbing. Um, I've been on hikes before. Um, I don't know that I've even been on a hike since I got injured, maybe. Um, but never been mountain climbing. So I had no idea what I was in for. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty awesome. Went out to Colorado um, and did some, you know, a little bit of learning about the ice axe and all that type of stuff and crampons and all that. And then, um, before I knew it, we were headed to Nepal. I, I've been to India before and Kathmandu is just like India. You know, it's a bustling city and cars squeezing by each other and loud noises and, you know, all that. But then we, we went from Kathmandu to, um, it, I have to remember it because it's important for the story. <laughs> Lukla. 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 We okay. Lukla. Okay. Why do they call it the world's scariest? You have to watch the video and you have to put that link up too. It's yeah. I'm going to. Which, which, let me just say. Oh, yeah. When I did research on this mountain climb oh, um, I typed in the mountain that we were climbing and the first video that came up on YouTube, because a lot of times mountaineers will show you the route they took and the video. And so I could have an idea what I was in for. The first video that came up on YouTube was like, watch Brian as he plummeted right before he plummeted to his death, basically. Oh no. And it was some guy like talking and then they're like in loving memory because he fell off the mountain. And I'm like, holy oh. crap did I sign up for yeah and that's what I was saying when we first started the show I was like that's it's no joke I mean that's a serious mountain it's like it's not like oh in um Lukla airport which is where we were flying into and it's the number one world scariest airport and uh you just have to look at the link because it's pretty unbelievable yeah do you know what's funny um, I actually remember uh, hearing about this airfield because I think it's got an approach where you literally fly towards a mountain and yes. and when you come out of the clouds there's like a big like red and white target thing on the side of the mountain that if you don't see it you fly away i mean you you climb out and you abort the the landing but if you see it good now you turn away from the mountain and you you land like it's insane no you can't abort oh uh, really the, so. the, the um the landing you only have like the length of a football field ah and if you don't do the sharp right, you hit into the mountain. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking you at it right now. You up high enough in that amount of time to do a fly flyover. Yeah, you can't climb um, out. Ugh. And if you go too low, you hit into the mountain. Yeah. Um, and the interesting part about this is these guys are really high altitude. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you and, – and these planes are no joke. Like, these are just little – crop duster i mean <laughs> they're insane and so you literally are praying that um that the pilot doesn't get altitude sickness doesn't pass out or whatever um the lady had 
she came through and had a tray with all this white stuff. And I said, what is that? Is that cotton candy? Like, what is that? <laughs> And it was like the cotton that you get from like your vitamin bottles. Yeah. And you're supposed to tear it off and put it in your ears because the engines are so loud. Oh, wow. If you're watching, basically, um, you know, you can see the, the planes only hold, you know, 12 people or something. So you can see what the pilot sees. Yeah. It's pretty intense. And I prayed a lot, a lot during that flight um, and was very, very happy to land safely. I must say that once we got out of the plane they were still erecting a um a monument for a plane that wasn't so lucky Ugh. so that was kind of our welcome um so that was a little bit intense so you, you watched a guy on video fall off the mountain then you see this airfield <laughs> you must have been like i mean right across the country is no big deal uh compared to this this is a little <laughs> Insane. Well, and I believe that what made me look up the airfield, because that's not something I would normally do, was that there was a crash um, not that long before we were leaving. And so it, it hit the news. Yeah. And so that's what got me looking at the airfield. Um, uh, okay. Like, oh, wow. So, yeah, pretty intense. Yeah, and um, but, I'm looking at a picture now where you can see the runway, and at the very end, it's a wall. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a it's wall. Sharp right, that's yeah. Sharp right. That's um, insane. So what's interesting about that part of Nepal, once you get out of Kathmandu, um, is that they don't have cars there, um, but they have airplanes. And so the people from that part of the world, if they've never you know made the trip to Kathmandu, have never seen. A, a vehicle yet they see airplanes constantly and i just think that that's that's so unique and so bizarre um they walk everything um you know you, you want to build a house you have to get your supplies probably from the airport if it's not something that you can you know make and walk it to wherever your village is, which could be, you know, miles and miles away, they walk everything. Um, and so that was a really unique aspect of it. Um, and of course, the closer you got to the mountains, which is the farther you get away from the, the airfield and all that, the more expensive beer and food and everything else got because, yeah. you know, somebody had to walk it there. It makes sense. It's no joke. Wow. They, uh, what I always tell, I try to remind people because you, you get it all the time. And I guess this kind of goes back to our civilians and, and military type of thing is, um, or, or, or how they don't understand each other is, you know, I'll be at a party or something and somebody like, Oh, my, my granite countertop has this wrong with it. Or, um, I hate my fridge cause I can't put, you know, this in it. It doesn't fit. And I'm like, you wake up every morning. And you flip a switch and you have hot water. You have cold water coming out of a big silver thing in your in your living room, or I mean in your kitchen that gives you cold ice and cold food. You have electricity. You have no clue what you just having a house with a kitchen puts you above like a huge majority of people in the world. Yeah. And it's it that's yeah, and it sounds like that's that's what you experienced going there. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty interesting. They um they take yak dung and they flatten it against the building. So you'll see just patties all over the outside of buildings. And they use that for numerous things. But one of the things they use it for is to heat. Um, so they'll throw it in the fire. So you're sitting just around. Houses made out of shit, you're basically saying. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're sitting. Well, I mean, they're just drying it. Oh, OK. Just OK. Drying it on the side of their house. <laughs> you better. But they use it. They, so when you look at it, that's what it looks like. But they use it um, for all different types of things, but, you know, to, to warm um, the building. So you'll go into, you know, a cafe or something, and they're just throwing, you know, it's cold out, and you're so happy to be by the fire, and, you're, and they're just throwing this in there, and it's smoking everywhere, and your ah. lungs are just filled with it, and you're coughing, but at least you're not cold. <laughs> 
cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's a trip, man. That's unbelievable. And all your food tastes like that just because that's how they, you know, it's their heat source. Wow. It's, it's a trip. Yeah, makes you makes you feel silly when you complain about like not having a good Wi-Fi signal or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you got to this city. Uh, what happens next? I mean, you guys had Sherpas and stuff, right? We did. Yeah. I don't know how people do it without Sherpas. It was awesome. We had Sherpas. We had yaks. Um, we had an awesome crew. Um, we basically walked to the mountain. It took us days, and I don't really remember how many, but, it, you know, it took us days to get to the mountain, and so there would be little, um, like, villages that we would stop in on the way there. Um, we got to... And the villages, uh, that has to be my favorite place in the world, is Nepal. I mean, it was spiritual. It was amazing it was amazing on so many different levels um i met a lot of village people and got to have a lot of really um, i mean just unbelievable experiences um they have they paint prayers on the side of the road um with the idea that you say this prayer and you leave your worries there and you don't take them on your journey. Um, they have, you know, big prayer wheels that you spin. Um, and I, I met some monks who were there to repaint all the prayer wheels and they let me paint one. Um, I met somebody that was repainting the prayers on the side of the road. And even though I had to believe him on what it said, cause I didn't <laughs> know, you know, he let me paint it. Um, I just, the, the culture and I mean, it was just, it was just unbelievable. And it's the most, I mean, it was just beautiful. It was breathtaking. It, I, it's just unbelievable. And it's a society that, um, you know, they're, they're isolated. Uh, and then we, they don't have all the distractions that we have. So they kind of have to uh, be together. They ha- it has to be a cohesive society or it would fall apart or they would die. I mean, it's not like they're, those villages right. are probably what, 10,000, 15,000 feet up. Yeah. Wow. So they're living. And then how did you, cause you're from Texas. I mean, so you're, you're a, uh, uh, flatlander basically. Uh, yes. how did you get acclimated? Was it just step by step or? Yeah. Yeah. It was just step by step. Cause we were, when we were in, um, I, I'm, I was born in New Hampshire, but still by the seacoast and I've never, never lived at altitude. And when we were at, uh, Lake Tahoe, I was getting out of breath running across the street because that's at like 6,000 feet or 5,000 feet. Um, were you experiencing any of that just walking around or is it something that you? I um, I had a few health issues. I didn't experience any bad altitude issues um, until we got to base camp. Mm-hmm. And then I knew that if I said anything that they wouldn't let me climb. <laughs> but I kept my mouth shut. All right. Typical military. Um, <laughs> yeah. I arranged to be in a tent by myself, which was really awesome. Um, and I puked most of the night uh, because I had bad altitude sickness. Before that, I mean, I'd see little signs here and there. I, I had a headache probably a few days before that. And, you know, little signs, but it didn't. It wasn't like in my face until I hit base camp. And then I was like, ah, but I had gone that far and I'm like, uh, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and make this happen. Did they put you on? um, I haven't prescribed it in years because I haven't had a patient that's that's uh, gone mountain climbing. But there's a medicine you can take. And I can't think of it off the top of my head um, that actually helps you with with altitude sickness. They did not that I can remember. I don't think we we had anything like that. Um, there was some stuff available after you had altitude sickness. Okay, but I mean the the real only um, remedy for altitude sickness is to get lower, mm-hmm. and the 
as fast as you can, basically. But there was some stuff, like if you had headaches, I think they could give you some stuff to try and help with. Yeah. I'll I, I really don't remember, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> and then how long did you stay at base camp before you guys uh, – pushed up and was it one of those things where you 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 uh climb for a day and then sleep climb for another day and then sleep and then have a push to the summit or did you go from base camp to the summit we went from base camp to like advanced base camp and then back to base camp and then to advanced base camp and then stayed and then to the summit and back. Okay. So that was kind of like to acclimate you too. also. Um, yeah. What's it like to sleep on the side of a mountain? I mean, and there's, there's one type of sleeping, right? You go camping and all right, you're at, you're on the side of a mountain. That's one thing, but you're literally sleeping on the top of the world. Like it's you and space. <laughs> it was, um, it was absolutely breathtaking. It was gorgeous. It wasn't, we weren't like on a cliff like you see, uh, like what Chad probably had to do. We weren't on a cliff. Um, there was like a little patch and it had the water from the glacier, from the um, mountain that had kind of dripped off. So it was this beautiful, bright blue lake or little pond. Um, and it was cold, but it was, I mean, it was gorgeous. Yeah. Any bad weather, uh, during your, your track or, um, so mind you, I've never climbed before. Right. Right. And so the day before I, or maybe a couple of days before, I think, um, if you watch the movie, you can see where Chad points out the mountain and is like, wow, you know, this yeah. is tense. Um, and one of the Sherpas points out to me where the potential avalanches were. Oh, nice. And I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little intense. Um, and I didn't know, like, what does that mean? And so they were debating on if we would be able to climb it or not because of the potential of avalanches they decided that we were going to which i had a lot of mixed emotions about because sure. i really wanted to climb but i kind of didn't want to die either yeah and that know? would be a terrifying way to die i would think <laughs> yeah like uh um uh, but i mean at the same time at least it's not like hey you know a car accident or something yeah, like that's at true least it's, you leave know. a better story when you're left on the side of a yeah. mountain in nepal i guess um and so we had to leave really early in the morning to start to make sure that we could summit before the sun got too strong so that the potential of avalanche would go down because obviously the more it melted, the more likely it is, you know. So um, that part was um, we just had to leave early. But, you know, since then I did the Grand Tetons and the Grand Teton weather was a lot worse than the weather on Nepal. So okay. yeah, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that bad weather wise. Yeah. Well, it was 2014. I want to say it was 2014. Cause I was reading all about Chad's recent climb that they, they lost like 20 something people on Everest yeah. in like one, one uh, avalanche. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's something you got to deal with. Would you do it now that you have children? Would you even consider it? Whoa. Um, I mean, I wouldn't do it right now. I don't have the opportunity to. My children no. come first and I need to be here for them. And so that's nothing with doing anything without them isn't even an option in my mind. Yeah. Um, if they were older... I don't know. It's a very selfish act. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know that the potential is to die. Yeah. Um, for something that is recreational. Mm hmm. Uh, I, I guess it depends how, if they were 18 and out of the house, maybe. I yeah. think it, it would be hard for me to rationalize making such a decision and knowing that I could leave my kids 
um, you know, without a mom, like yeah. that's pretty intense. Isn't it amazing um, how those things change? How, I don't even yeah. ride my bike on the road anymore. Uh, yeah. it got too crazy. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. This is not, it's not worth it to be killed on a bike. I mean, I, I found other things to do. I found your your website, which I didn't even... Let me pull this up here. Uh, Summit IDG. Tell me about that. So a little bit like what we were talking about before, the, the need for having um, to be part of something. Right. And I think that what helped me um, was the bike ride, for instance. The bike ride, I had to do the work, which I think is really important. Um, I had to do the work, but I was part of a team. Um, and it made me talk even when I didn't want to, you know, you had to point out potholes and you had to, you had to communicate with people, um, even when I didn't feel like it. Yeah. And I think that there was a lot of healing that went into that. And eventually that that grew into something more. And Summit IDG is a nonprofit that helps those injured in the line of duty. So police, firemen, um, and military that um, meet their fitness goals, whatever that is. So if it's being able to ride a bike around the block with their kids, or if it's climbing Mount Everest, or if it's, um, we have a guy right now, David, who's, um, doing the entire Appalachian, um, Appalachian trail. Wow. That's a big one. That's um, in my neck of the woods. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think that there's a lot of healing that comes in being physically active, um, both emotionally and mentally and physically um you know it helps with those neurons it helps connect those neurons so if you have a tbi and you can find a way to be physically active it can help you if you have pts and you can find a way to be physically active it can help you um you know burn off steam and and emotionally um and it can help you feel like you're part of a team again. Yeah. Um, and so we have a group of volunteers that, um, and we're still pretty small right now. Um, but we have a group of volunteers that help um, either mentor or coach. So we have mentors that are doing the sport that somebody's interested in. Um, uh, we have somebody doing an Ironman coming up. So they have a mentor that's done Ironmans before. They have a coach that can train them on Ironmans. And then they all, we also have um, a physical therapist that we can hit up if we have any concerns or questions about any of it. Uh, the biggest challenge that I had in my recovery was that I'm kind of a type A personality <laughs> and just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and um, most of the physical therapists that I met um, just wanted me to be functional. And I wanted to be a lot more than functional. And most of the personal trainers I met wanted me to, hell yeah, you know, let's do this. But they didn't understand my injuries. And so I really wanted to bridge that gap. Right. Um, I think that the, the VA and the military is doing a much better job at bridging that gap. But um, at the time, I didn't feel like they were. And so I, I wanted to provide something for people. Um, and I think that there's a different aspect that comes with injuries when you're injured in the line of duty than, um, you know, injured in a car accident or something like that. So I wanted to address that, too. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how this baby got you know, started. And, uh, I took some time off when I had my girls to be present with them and, you know, um, and now I'm, I'm getting right back in it, but we're still small, but we're going strong and helping as many people as we can. That's awesome. And you, you bring obviously the experience, which, uh, you know, someone could, someone who studies kinesiology or studies, I don't know, psychology could come in and, and say, you know, this is what we think it's going to be, but you're, you're, <laughs> living, breathing proof, uh, about the benefits of these, these programs. Well, um, I just looked over at the clock and I've been, I've been, uh, keeping you here for now an hour and a half. That's, 
Sure. Well, people can find you at uh, Summit, S-U-M-M-I-T, because I'm a terrible speller. I would spell it uh, whatever, but it's S-U-M-M-I-T-I-D-G dot org. Um, and you can check out all our stuff on there. Is there any, anywhere else you want to drive people to if they're interested in learning about um, Nicolette? Right now, our Facebook page is a little more active okay. than our um, website, but we're looking for media volunteers. So if anybody wants to help us with our website, Facebook page, please feel free okay. to contact me. <laughs> and it looks like it's um, facebook.com slash summit IDG. So um, kind of, there's a bunch of other numbers after it, but I don't think that, I think that's, I'm not very good at technology. I just press buttons <laughs> and, but I think, yeah, I think, let me just try it just so I can be sure. Sorry, this page isn't available. All right, just go to go to go to Summit <laughs> IDG and click on the little Facebook thing, and then you'll be able to see. Um, but that's great. Well, uh, you know, awesome getting in touch with you. Um, here, I'll like your page right now too. I'm gonna click Thank like. You. Um, thanks for spending time with me. All right, All right. it's good talking to you. Keep in touch. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye.